Hello and welcome to To The Point. The Prime Minister Narendra Modi has announced and unveiled the Make in India challenge. The big question is how will Indian industry respond to this challenge and what are the opportunities going ahead? Joining me to discuss that, particularly in the context of aerospace and defense, is Jamshed Godrej, Chairman and Managing Director of Godrej Voice. Mr. Godrej, thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure. So, uh, I'm going to come to the Make in India bit in a short while. But before that, uh, congratulations on the fact that we've had a successful uh, Mars mission and on which uh, an engine produced right here in these premises played a critical role, apart from other components of the uh, of the mission. So tell us more. I mean, what's uh, uh, the journey to build this uh, engine and other parts in the Mars mission, and uh, how did Godrej get involved in this? Well, you know, it's almost three decades now that we've been working with ISRO. Uh, when Dr. Kalam was very much uh, there at that time, he actually approached us along with uh, Professor Rao and uh, then later Professor. Uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan and others. You see, I think what they recognized was that we have an expertise in sheet metal work mm -hmm. uh, and in precision engineering because we've, you know, we had one of the largest and most independent tool rooms uh, uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. So they actually approached us about 30 years ago saying that would you please take on the manufacture of this uh, Vikas engine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's licensed uh, from uh, the French. Mm -hmm. And what we do is basically just produce uh, uh, precision components. Mm -hmm. So there are sheet metal components uh, like the nozzle, for instance. There are uh, highly intricate uh, machined parts. And uh, so we produce, you know, uh, the, so what you would say is the heart of the engine. Mm -hmm. The rest of the engine, which is the integration and putting it all together, is all done by ISRO. Right. So we just, we, our speciality has been precision engineering, mm -hmm. uh, both in uh, machined parts and in fabricated parts. Right. Uh, and using exotic materials and, you know, whatever is required for aerospace and defense. Mm -hmm. uh, and because they recognized that we had uh, some sort of expertise in that, they came to us. But it's been a huge learning curve for us. I mean, despite the fact that they may have thought that we had expertise, we had to learn everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but over the last 30 years, we have uh, we have understood this uh, technology. We have understood uh, what it is uh, that it takes to to make these type of engines. It's under very very strict control and inspection uh, of ISRO and its uh, engineers. Uh, so I think you know to a very large extent this is a very collaborative uh, work. I mean to some extent uh, uh, you're you're doing things uh, very often where you don't know what the results are going to be. Uh, it's not just uh, engineering. There's also some uh, art and technique uh, to many of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that overall, it's been a, it's been a good journey. We've learned a lot. I think it's helped us uh, in our businesses uh, to understand what is the meaning uh, of precision, what is the meaning of uh, doing things to right. very, very exacting standards. Right. So th that's really my next question. So what is it that you've learned that you've uh, been able to migrate onto other businesses? And what is it that could have been migrated in terms of scale uh, and, and reach, but which has not been done? Well, on the scale issue, I mean, you know, we have to understand that ISRO has a limitation in terms of what they can do. Mm -hmm. They are gearing up actually mm. uh, to do a lot mm. because uh, it, in a way it, uh, we have the best position today for low orbit satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is can we make enough satellites mm. uh, to meet the global demand for telecommunications, TV and you know all of that. Uh, there's a huge demand uh, for low earth uh, GPS for instance. You know, they're, they're, so and although we have been gearing ourselves up we have not been able to do the number of launches mm -hmm. uh, that we would like to. So I think scale is important. I think ISRO should now that they have proved their uh, capability and expertise. I think scale is the next uh, big option for them mm -hmm. and the big opportunity for them. And, and you're also saying that companies like you are in a position to meet that demand. Were there to be? Oh yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. I think that we are, we are we, it's taken a long time to learn, but once you learn, mm -hmm. You know, that's the time to really take off. Mm -hmm. And it's not just us. I mean, everybody, all the industry partners who mm -hmm. work with ISRO, you know, have learned over time and are now at a position where takeoff is possible. Right. Yeah. But that's as far as PSLV is concerned, which is what put this, uh, the, the Mars mission, uh, yeah. mission into orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the GSLV, it's a slightly different story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's, it's a more complex it's much higher uh, orbit, mm. uh, the payloads are larger, mm. uh, the type of configuration you need is different. 
the technology on the cryo engine which we got from Russia uh, has taken a very very long time to uh, to solve but the last launch was flawless mm. uh, using uh, components which we made for the cryo engine uh, so I think that you know ISRO is definitely in a good position you know they have licked many of the technologies which were a great challenge but I think for them the, the biggest challenge is going to be uh, attracting young people who have that aspiration mm -hmm. and I think that if you ask me in my mind mm -hmm. you know one of the biggest advantages that ISRO will get out of the mass mission mm -hmm. is is this popular uh, belief that will be spread amongst young engineers mm -hmm. that this is a can-do organization and we should join right. you know and I think that because at the end of the day human resources mm -hmm. you know is is everything mm -hmm. you know if, if the government organizations like ISRO are able to attract high quality people you know it will make a huge difference in their ability to perform right so you're also therefore saying that we've reached as a country a tipping point which is a confluence of the work that you're doing the, the lead that ISRO has been taking in this effort and so on and the number of missions that we've done so if we've reached this tipping point how do we capitalize on this as a country or a nation to uh, take it forward not just in uh, uh, in space missions but also space and defense well, I think defense is a slightly different... Mm -hmm. uh, As an opportunity for yeah. private sector, yeah, yeah. for instance. Yeah. See, I think that uh, in many ways, if you look at it, um, uh, ISRO has relied almost exclusively on the private sector mm -hmm. for scaling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, of course, there have been, there are many, many government-linked uh, organizations involved uh, mm -hmm. and connected with ISRO, no doubt. But, but to a very large extent, they have, they have uh, you know, put their bet on the private sector. I think it's very different from defense you know that that's a very different position mm. you know I think in defense uh, they have very they are very very government has been very reluctant mm. to work with uh, the private sector you know and I think that the present government but that sounds in a in a way contradictory right I mean this seems more sensitive and far more at stake and why well I think that part of the reason is mm. that the number of public sector undertakings involved in defense production you know whether it's for, for the army the navy the air force whatever is very very large mm. you know I mean the government have right from the beginning invested heavily right. in defense production mm. you know uh, and because they invested heavily in defense production they felt they had the capability and mm. they didn't need the private sector mm. you see I think that was that right. was the position they came from mm. I think they realized along the way you know that productionizing something on a, on a you know on a production line if you have to produce one say one aircraft a month mm. you know is a very different story from producing one aircraft a year mm. and and that's where you need the expertise of the private sector mm. and and who who understand uh, you know what it takes to productionize something do it in serial production mm. I think the government and government linked R&D organizations are very good in R&D one-off producing something pro proving a concept uh, but it's it's really quite a different game mm -hmm. to productionize I mean we've learned the hard way mm. you know that it was all very well then maybe 10 years after we started, we produced one engine for ISRO, mm. you know, mm. and that also as a trial, not as to fly. Mm. So it takes a long, long time. The learning curve is immense. Mm. But once you learn, mm. then you must also learn how to productionize. Right. I think if you don't learn how to productionize, then that's where the problem comes and then you get dependent on imports. Right. So what's the next uh, ne next challenge and the opportunity? If we were to take some of this learning from, let's say, organizations and facilities like this into the realm of defense and more private participation in defense? Well, I think it starts with trust. Mm. You know, I think uh, I remember I was in a meeting many years ago, <laughs> maybe more than a decade ago, when Mr. Ratan Tata told our prime minister, you know, that there is a trust deficit mm. uh, with the government as far as the private sector is concerned in defense. And uh, the pr prime minister more or less nodded in agreement, you know. And this, I think, is is the major cause. I think it's nothing to do with keep capability, capacity, investment, etc. I think this is this is the single most important point. Okay, mm -hmm. are you are you ready to trust Indian companies in defence versus buying from foreign companies? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think the armed and forces. You're also saying, saying the capability, capability which uh, yeah, I mean, see. as a layperson, I'm not sure whether Indian companies have developed that. No, but see, capability mm. comes from experience. Mm. Okay, if you if I'm never given an opportunity to do something, mm. you will always say I'm not capable. Mm. Okay, so there is a learning curve. There's sure. no doubt about it. It may take 10 years. It may take 20 years. Mm. But when you start, okay, in a in a position of trust and partnership and cooperation, anything is possible.
in my mind any you know any good top quality company in india if they really put their mind to it and they look for the long term mm. this is not a short term uh, business you know if you are in this business of aerospace you are in it for the long haul you will not make money for the first 15 or 20 years mm. you know i mean this is the type of business that it is I mean, and it's a global globally this is the experience you see right. so i think if if the government and the armed forces i think more than the government it's even the armed forces mm. the armed forces have to trust the private sector mm. yeah okay you've been buying vehicles and you've been buying uh, uniforms and all those sort of things which are not you know critical in that sense from the private sector but now you have to learn to buy every you know forward item you know whether it's a missile whether it's an aeroplane mm -hmm. whether it's a ship you know whatever it is i think that the if the government and the armed forces put their trust in the private sector there is no doubt in my mind that given sufficient uh, time and sufficient facility mm -hmm. see the point again is you know government when they buy uh you know this is this is one of their 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 big uh, uh, long term problems mm. is is how to buy mm. from from capable people at the right price mm. okay their their normal answer is that we'll have a tender and whoever's lowest will win you know this will not work in this business mm. in the aerospace business if you are serious about defense production you have to understand who the capable people are and put your money behind them mm. uh and support them and i think this has to be a national objective you know it can't be that you know there are certain departments of the government who only sort of are ready to say that no this is not right that that's not going to work it has to be a partnership it's a learning process you know i don't know today if you ask me to build a plane today and say give me a quote i won't know how to quote mm. i mean i have to first learn how to make that before i can quote right but more importantly you're saying quite confidently that you will build a plane if given a chance certainly i think the yeah. indian private sector is today in a position to make everything mm. and anything that is required given trust mm. and time and cooperation uh, mr mr goji before we went into the break we were talking about you know uh, the mars mission the connect with space and defense and the sheer opportunities ahead let's now look at the larger make in india challenge and opportunity the uh, the, the prime minister has unveiled a make in india campaign uh, it's uh, it's an attempt to woo investment both foreign and indian uh, uh, clear up all the uh, sort of roadblocks and hurdles and and hopefully uh, evolve to a situation where as a country we are maybe uh, moving on the manufacturing map so to speak how do you see the effort well i think that is a welcome initiative uh, of the prime minister mm -hmm. i think that a slogan like make in india i think is very catchy mm -hmm. i think it brings together uh, all the different organizations and departments and government to focus on this one issue mm -hmm. i think that in the past uh, ever since our foreign exchange reserves uh, swelled adequately you know there was this uh, general uh, uh, sort of diktat from government that it doesn't matter whether it's made in india or whether it's imported we are neutral to it mm. we will buy that at the lowest cost mm. you see mm. i think and and so he's he's actually changed the the narrative here mm. you know he said that look let's understand how are we going to progress mm. okay are we going to progress only on services mm. or is there a role for manufacturing mm. and make in india i think brings out that very clearly right. uh, and i think that uh, you know it's not just about slogans mm. okay it obviously has to be followed up with hundreds of little things mm. that will make the difference over time yeah and there are many many things that have to be done you know right. i mean you can't and this is not a big bang thing you know mm. this is a series of small things that have to be done consistently over time which will change the position right and if anything we've actually lost a lot of time uh, because i mean among other things the numbers reflect slowing industrial growth uh, the number i mean the the fact is that infrastructure has not kept pace so where are we exactly starting here and you know in some sense have we lost the race well i wouldn't say that we've lost the race i think that you know our studies mm -hmm. uh, in cii and others have mm -hmm. shown that we we have the capability and we are today manufacturing things uh for global markets for indian markets in a very successful way mm. this is about scale mm. and scaling up okay it's also about understanding what were the problems of the past mm. i give you a small example mm. you know we had this uh, right from the beginning we had the policy of reservation for small scale mm. okay so what in in theory and in concept it's a good idea to say that you have to encourage small industry but i think that it went so far mm. the other way mm. 
where we were not in a position to build scale on things of labor intensive things like toys for instance clothing mm. okay even even simple things i'm told now i don't know for sure but i'm told that for every festival in india everything that you need to buy for the festival whether they are idols or whatever yeah. come from china yeah. in fact i read uh, a few days ago that even plain simple stainless steel thalis mm -hmm. and utensils come from china mm -hmm. now these were items which were reserved for small scale mm -hmm. okay so what are we up against okay our tiny sector and small sector is up against giants in the rest of the world mm -hmm. making those items yeah You know? So you're saying, but light engineering, but in scale. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. A, the whole point is about scale. I mean, no, no small industry in India can ever have the the competitive position mm. that a Chinese manufacturer or in you know or any other manufacturer anywhere in the world which can have with scale. So whether it's stainless steel utensils or idols or clothing or whatever it is, scale is what brings competitiveness. Mm. Okay, and I think that this understanding has has been evolving. Mm. most of the items that were reserved for small scale are gone mm. there are still a few mm. okay i'm sure they'll clean it up over time but my point really here is that we have to understand that there is a role for tiny small medium and large mm. there is a supply chain mm. i think if we don't develop the supply chain in everybody's advantage mm. it has to be for everyone mm. this it has to be for the small and medium and large everyone has to benefit from this supply chain there is a role for everybody and i think if you if you look at other economies who have been successful in manufacturing especially germany mm. okay why is the the so called mittelstand you know mm. the middle middle mm. sort of uh, small mid size yeah. family mid size mm. uh, family owned firms with a lot of expertise and skill you know many of these uh, mittelstand companies i know from my experience in machine tools mm. you know they are world beaters in a particular product mm. they 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 dominate the world in that item mm. even though they are a middle sized company mm. because they have the technology they have the skills they have the capability and they have support you know you have a cluster you know this is this is something that we have to understand that industry on its own cannot survive without a cluster of support right. so everything that you need to support industry or a particular industry mm. you know individual industry it's very well illustrated actually by uh, porter in his book on competitiveness mm. you know he talks of the italian shoe fashion industry mm. you know and every in a in a one particular part of italy everything that you need to make a shoe whether it's uppers lowers you know heels it's you know fashion it's design it's everything that's it's all there so it's a cluster mm. it makes that that cluster extremely competitive and right. this is what we need so that's let's say the one of uh, first uh, or the one of the key pre uh, prerequisites for success in the make in india campaign what could be the others considering also the fact that companies like yourselves are now global multinationals you need not necessarily produce here to sell here yeah. so i think that you mentioned it you know infrastructure is very crucial i mean whether it's to do with power is to do with roads it's airports it's whatever and the soft infrastructure that goes with it okay mm. deregulation mm. okay i think uh, very very effectively uh, the prime minister has talked of removing regulation mm. rather than bringing new regulation in mm. i think we all recognize you know that we are over regulated you know there are too many laws uh, not well regulated mm. not well you know sort of administered etc mm. so i think we need to simplification uh, e-commerce will be a good way to you know uh, doing things in a uh electronically will be a very good way to uh, reduce uh, paperwork and things like that improve speed mm. i think speed is is again you know of essence in global markets so i think there are many many small things like that mm. to do with physical infrastructure uh, social infrastructure infrastructure to support industry uh and i think all these things will require lots of uh, new things to be done new things in the sense that you pick up what's good about the system mm. remove all the useless things in the system i think that's the right approach mm. i think when the prime minister has been saying that i want to remove one law every day mm. you know i think that's that gives a good message mm. and and the right message mm. so uh, it, it you're also seems in consonance with the prime minister's statement that he wants to work on the small things to improve the big things and and not necessarily the other way around yeah i yeah. think in india yeah. and maybe probably anywhere in the world you know this big bang approach mm. you know has its limitations i think if you do thousands of small things on a consistent basis every day day in and day out i think you're much better off right 
So if I were to ask you from a, as a, as a manufacturing company that's been around for uh, uh, decades actually, more than, I mean almost more than a century, yeah. So uh, what, what, if you were to now look at the India opportunity, I mean coming from where we are, uh, what are the two or three things that are critical to be done quickly so as to give you the confidence to invest further? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we, we the, the, from a global perspective today, you know, we are in a difficult position. It's not that the global mm. market is uh, booming. Mm. But if you look at India's position in the globe, it's, it's tiny, mm. you know, in terms of our participation in global trade. So we have huge opportunity in global trade. So if we can get our competitiveness in position, okay, if we can get our, uh, you know, our ease of doing business uh, issues in, in position, you know. So if we can put some of these things in place, I think you will see a huge spurt in global markets. I, there, there's no doubt in my mind that no matter which item you take, you know, whether it's in engineering or non-engineering or services, I think India has a huge opportunity, right. you know, and because basically because our penetration levels are very, very low. Right. So the other which sort of allied subject is of course to do with jobs and skilling or skilling and jobs in that order. A lot of the growth in the last uh, decade or so, uh, and there has been growth, uh, has been in a way jobless. Right. How is that going to change? And Well, I think that uh, there's no doubt at all in my mind that automation will play a huge role in the future. You know, I think part of the reason, it's nothing to do with labor mm. so much. Mm. You know, it's about consistency. Uh, it's about reliability. I mean, there are many, many things like that which require automation, okay? So I think we have to, the, the increase in labor mm. uh, to do anything is only going to come over time, mm. okay? At the moment, it's, it's you know, it's, it's growth without uh, uh, really understanding, you know, where that growth will come from. Mm. But I'm sure that we will be able to do a lot in future. Hmm. Uh, as a result of that. But, but is that going to come because capacity expansion will drive it or new industries will come up potentially? Everything, everything. everything. Hmm. I mean, for instance, I mean, we know that, you know, even buying land hmm. has been an issue, hmm. okay? The quality of industrial infrastructure is an issue, hmm. okay? Now, for instance, we went many years, more than a decade ago, we moved our factories from Singapore and Malaysia to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a factory in Indonesia also years back. Everything we moved to Vietnam. Now, this the, the experiment in Vietnam together with Singapore is quite unique. Mm. Singapore set up mm. an industrial park in mm. Vietnam. Mm. But it wasn't the infrastructure only. So the infrastructure was exactly like Singapore. Mm. But it was the physical, uh, it was the social infrastructure that they set up, which is skill training and government regulation. So in effect, the park had the ability to clear everything that you needed, you know, mm. all rules, all regulations, customs, excise, sales tax, everything was done at the park. Almost it, like an SEZ. Yeah, it's, it is it, it is, is an, an SEZ, SEZ okay. in more or less, you mm. know, you could say. But the point is, it's the government doesn't leave you to your own devices. Mm. They make sure that everything that you need to operate is done there. Okay. And this is the type of attitude that we will require from every state government, mm. you know, because at the end of the day, the center has a limitation on what gets done on the ground. Mm. It's all done in the states. Mm. The state which takes this attitude forward, you know, which says deregulate, make things simple, speed, okay, and it can only be done if people at the top take a view that, you know, we, we are not going to pass your papers through thousands of uh, government employees. You know, we will take, it is our responsibility to get something done. So let me then ask you a slightly larger question. How much role does government play or could play uh, in future as you were to realize some of the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the challenges or the opportunities, uh, opportunities actually that you spoke of, but more importantly, how much of it can be, uh, is more dependent on the state? I mean, if you can tell me in a, in a percentage sense. Yeah. No, I think everything on the ground is dependent on the state, mm. okay? I mean, once the... Uh, how much time you have to spend as... as I think a, almost, as I would say that 90% of the time mm. of any, you know, for any industry goes in managing at the state level. Mm -hmm. I would say even 99%, you know, when it's deregulated, what is the center going to do, mm. okay? Everything is at the state level. And I think this is really a problem. Those state chief ministers, you know, who have understood this point, and really worked on, on the issue to, to streamline things. You know, those are the states which are making progress, okay? So I think that the states will have to understand that the type of bureaucratic, uh, you know, rigmaroles that happen all the time 
you know and different departments uh, sort of uh, arguing with each other not getting things mm -hmm. done i mean that that part of what is in the government black box you know must be solved if it is not solved at the state level you will never see uh, progress on manufacturing right. okay so last question what's the most exciting uh, manufacturing or manufacturing led project that you would like to work on well i think that at the moment our you know whatever we are doing uh, on aerospace and defense is definitely exciting it's it's not something that gives us a lot of uh, turnover and mm. profit uh, in fact yeah. we we don't make money in right. all these things because there's not enough scale again yeah. yeah but actually it gives a lot of satisfaction that that you have the capability you have the capacity uh, to do something that is challenging uh, yes of course uh, uh, you know in our traditional businesses uh, that goes on for instance we've just uh, you know in home appliances i think innovation at the end of the day becomes everything mm -hmm. you know so how do you how do you really take care of things of innovation in such a way that it can make a really good impression on customers and and you can produce something that's fantastic and i think that so everything you know i mean when you talk of manufacturing you can't say there's a role for design there's a role for innovation there's a role for everything mm -hmm. you know it's it all comes together only when you can produce a final product which can delight someone Mr. Gotis, thank you very much for speaking with us. Well, that's all we have time for on to the point.